Many times in the past, we have covered cases of missing people, and we have covered cases of victims who were not identified after years had gone by. This week, we're going to cover something a little bit different. One of Canada's longest standing mysteries encircles the case of Canada's first ever suicide bomber in Kenora, Ontario. The man entered the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce with the intent to rob the bank, and a series of circumstances led to a sudden death when a bomb detonated, and the entire thing was witnessed by many people who had arrived at the scene to take in the action. Who was the man that robbed the bank that day and lost his life in the streets of Kenora? Fifty years later, nobody knows. Hello, my name is Lance, and welcome to episode 106 of Gone But Never Forgotten, Canada's first suicide bomber, the story of the Kenora bomber. Kenora, Ontario is situated on the Lake of the Woods in Ontario, Canada, and is right close to the Manitoba-Ontario border, sitting approximately 210 kilometers or 130 miles to the east of Winnipeg, Manitoba. Today, the city of Kenora has a population that sits around the 15,000 mark, but in 1973, when our story takes place, the population was around 11,000 people. So, Kenora, as you can imagine, was kind of a sleepy little town where not a lot went on on a day-to-day basis. May 10th of 1973 was a cold, dark, and dreary day, normal for that time of year in Kenora. The temperature sat around 6 degrees Celsius, or 44 degrees Fahrenheit, and people started the day going about their business. It was a Thursday. One of the people that was going about his business was a man that was not from Kenora and his business was about to turn the small city on its head in a set of circumstances that would never be forgotten. A lone man was preparing to rob a bank, and he was preparing to do so while heavily armed with a rifle, a pistol, a bomb, and bags for money that he intended to have stuffed with money as he held up the bank. Just before 3 p.m., the man would walk into the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, and he walked directly into the office of the bank manager, who was in the middle of a phone call and interrupted. He told the bank manager, who was Al Reed, that he was robbing the bank and that he wanted his bags filled with money, and he wanted Al to call the police so that he could show the police that he meant business in this robbery, and also that he had sticks of dynamite with him. The man also had a small device that looked like a clothespin that was attached to his mouth. That is called a dead man switch, and is a device that is designed to cause a bomb to go off if the person wearing the switch is incapacitated in any way. The man then left Al's office and demanded that all of the other customers inside of the bank leave immediately. Of course, the sight of customers fleeing a bank caught the attention of everyone that was in the vicinity of downtown Kenora, and that included the people that were working just across the street from the bank at Kenora's radio station, CJRL. 
You may be familiar with The War of the Worlds, which was a broadcast by CBS Radio that took place on October 30th of 1938, and it depicted an alien invasion that caused some widespread panic. Well, CJRL realized that what had landed right in their lap was their very own moment, like The War of the Worlds, except this was real. The DJs on the radio realized that they could broadcast live and tell all of the people listening what was happening across the road at the bank. This was a moment in time and an opportunity that they could not pass up. And so, the windows for the radio station were removed quickly so that the DJs could lean out the windows and see everything that was going on below them. As I said, this was certainly seen as an opportunity because in 1973, it was incredibly rare for anyone, especially a radio station, to be covering any breaking news and especially in a live format. The DJs were Chris Paulson and John Barry, and they saw their opportunity and they ran with it. Their broadcast would enthrall everyone and anyone that was listening in or around the Kenora area. The broadcast, of course, started with the DJs announcing that there was a bank robbery in progress at the bank, and that the public should stay away from the scene, but, as you can imagine, the opposite is what happened. People in Kenora left work, parents pulled their children out of school, and a lot of people descended on the area that surrounded the bank so that they could witness whatever was happening and whatever was to come. Over 1,000 people would gather at the scene, almost 10% of the total population of Kenora at the time. Witnesses said after the fact that they simply could not pass up the opportunity to watch something take place that was Not just incredibly rare in Kenora, but unheard of in Kenora. Witnesses would even say that they were aware that the robber likely did have a gun, so they tended to hang back a little bit, standing in the third or second row of people so that they could ensure as best possible that they would not be in harm's way if things got awry. When when the police arrived at the scene, they went to the bank to meet with the robber, as he had requested. He did so because he did want the police to see all of the weapons that he had so that they would fully understand the situation. He needed everyone to know that if anything went wrong, he had the ability to kill a lot of people in a short amount of time. He especially wanted the police to know that he had a bomb that was made out of six sticks of dynamite. The robber also showed police the dead man's switch that was in his mouth and ensured that the police were aware of what it was and what it could do. The police, of course, wanted to negotiate with the robber and talk the situation down so that things didn't get out of control. And that was exacerbated by the fact that there were over 1,000 people watching on and watching every move within steps of a man who the police knew was very heavily armed. The radio station continued to talk live on the air and fill in information to everyone that was listening on. They even reported that there was a police officer on the roof of their building, and he was keeping an eye on everything, and they said that that officer had a rifle with him on the roof. The radio station was so close to the entire situation that in the background of the radio program, you could actually clearly make out the words of police officers in the street who were telling people to get back and keep a safe perimeter between themselves and the bank. As everyone in town heard about what was going on, there were many reactions. As we've covered, many people made their way down to the scene. Others still didn't believe that the story was true when they heard it, and they carried on about their daily lives. But one man would cause chaos at the scene when he heard about the bank robbery that was in progress. The man had been drinking in the hotel next door, and he decided that he was personally going to put an end to the robbery and become a hero. 
the inebriated man stumbled across the street to the bank and walked right in the front door. As he entered, the bank manager tried in vain to tell him to leave the bank because there was a robbery in progress, but the man did not take heed to the warning, and instead he approached the robber and engaged with him. He was certain that he could end the robbery and save countless lives. The robber, however, would quickly be taken aback by the strange and unexpected series of events, and he had no desire to engage verbally or physically with this inebriated man. And so, he fired his gun twice at the floor, and the drunk man fled the bank in fear. That man was certainly incredibly stupid and incredibly lucky. The fact that he walked into that bank and didn't become collateral damage to that robbery is a testament of both of those things. Not too long later, there would be another gunshot that rang out from inside of the bank where the employees were working as fast as they possibly could to stuff the bags for the robber. While the robber was waiting, he tried to open one of the drawers at a teller's desk by using the rifle that he had to jimmy it open. In the process of doing so, he wound up firing that rifle and scaring himself and everyone else inside of the bank half to death in the process. Around this time, the robber also made his demands to the police. He told police that he wanted to have a getaway truck provided and a getaway driver provided so that he could flee the scene. He said that if those things were provided and he was allowed to leave, nobody would get hurt. One of the police officers that was on the scene, Officer Don Milliard, spoke up, and he said that he would go and get out of uniform and dress up as a getaway driver to show up with a truck to appease the robber so that they could get him out of the bank and hopefully out of harm's way. When he arrived inside of the bank, the robber told him to grab the bags of money and take them out to the truck. With well over a thousand people now watching on and the radio broadcast continuing in earnest, Officer Milliard and the robber emerged from the bank. There was silence in the streets, and the radio DJs set the scene as the two men walked out. Once the robber stepped foot outside of the bank, he looked dead on at the police officers in the road and the scene around him, and then the silence was broken and chaos ensued in one fleeting moment. What was heard first was one single bullet shot from a sniper rifle. It connected with the robber and instantly the dead man's switch went off and there was an incredible explosion, the likes of which... Nobody had expected. The radio DJ screamed that the bomb had gone off, and all hell broke loose. Windows were blown out over city blocks, and there was money, blood, and even pieces of human remains flying through the air. Witnesses described the scene, saying that there was a serene quiet, and then when the bomb exploded, everything erupted into chaos, in a moment once everyone truly realized what had happened. There were people running, people screaming, and absolute chaos was everywhere. They said that it smelled like burnt flesh in the streets, and there literally were body parts that were found blocks away from the explosion. The DJs would report that the bank robber was lying on the ground by a truck, but the reality was that what was beside the truck was simply human remains. The dead man's switch had essentially disintegrated the robber as soon as it had gone off. The single shot was shot by Sergeant Bob Latain. All of this had happened in the aftermath, and in the aftermath, there was money falling from the sky like leaves from a tree. The robber had made off with more than $100,000, which would be nearly $700,000 in today's money. People in the streets were grabbing as much as they possibly could. Shockingly, Officer Don Milliard was still alive. 
Luckily, he had been just far enough away from the robber turned bomber. He was sitting in the middle of the street, though, and clutching at his stomach at what he believed to be significant wounds to himself, and he was certainly, as you can expect, in shock. Another officer would point out, though, to Officer Milliard that the flesh and the blood that he was clinging to at his stomach, likely believing that he was in fact holding himself together, was not actually his flesh and blood. It was actually remains of the robber that had hit him in the explosion. Officer Milliard would be rushed to the hospital, and he would survive, but he did suffer from permanent hearing damage and would go on to have a career as a firefighter after the undoubted stress of this situation. In the aftermath, the DJ on the radio would hypothesize that the ordeal was over and that all that was left was the destruction from the bomb and, of course, the discovery of who the bank robber had been. The DJ believed that it would not be too long before all of the questions that the public would certainly have would be answered. It appeared at first that the hypothesis would not be wrong, as the manager of Hotel Kenrika would immediately reach out to police after seeing the man and say that he had been staying as a guest at the hotel. Obviously, police knew that that meant that they should have positive ID on the robber and even more information. The man was listed at the hotel as Paul Higgins. His information showed that he was from Toronto and he lived at 435 Glen Drive. Paul Higgins had checked into the hotel and stayed for two days before he disappeared for 10 days telling hotel staff to stay out of his room while he was gone. The room was prepaid for, and that meant that nobody needed to enter his room at all, and they were being paid. Paul had stayed in room 407, and investigators would find a large trunk inside of his room when they arrived to search. Police believed that there could quite possibly be a bomb inside of the chest, and so they decided to detonate the chest in a controlled explosion. That obviously meant that whatever was inside of the trunk, in terms of evidence, was destroyed at the scene. Unfortunately, that would not be the only hindrance to the investigation, though. Police started to run checks on Paul Higgins, and the address that he had provided at the hotel Everything came back as being fake. Paul Higgins was not the identity of the Kenora bomber. The coroner's report would state that the robber's fingers and toes were intact, and that meant that there was hope that fingerprints may help in identifying who the man was. Unfortunately, everything came back as negative for a match in their system, and the investigators were no further along in finding out who this mystery man was. An inquisition was held into how the police handled the entire situation, and that started roughly one month after the bombing. The results of that inquisition were the fact that police did not seem to have proper training or protocols in place to deal with a situation like this one. Officer Milliard would even say that the officers were left to their own devices in the face of the bank robbery, with nobody taking charge and nobody really having any idea how to negotiate or handle anything that was going on. In the end, the Inquisition would find that the police had acted in a manner that was to be commended under the circumstances. It was deemed also that Sergeant Bob Latane had been correct in taking the shot that he had taken on the bomber because there was certainly a chance that the man could have taken many more lives if he had perhaps ran into a crowd of bystanders and detonated the bomb there, for example. A composite sketch was also made of the man so that hopefully someone, somewhere, would recognize the man and correlate that with someone that they knew who they had not seen for some time, thusly helping police to determine, hopefully, who the bomber was. Witnesses around town, including Joe Relko, who was a witness and would later write a book called The Devil's Gap about the robbery and bombing, 
would say that they had actually seen the man around Kenora quite a bit in the time leading up to the robbery. Witnesses would say that the man spoke with what they believed was a German accent. Joe Ralco even said that the man had even started to seemingly start a routine in town, going to the same places at the same times every day. One of those places was the Plaza Restaurant, and everyone seemed to be taken aback by some of the ways in which the man had acted. Inside of the restaurant, the man had always faced into the restaurant in a booth, looking at people and the staff the entire time that he was there, as opposed to most people who would come by themselves facing out of the restaurant. Joe said that in hindsight, it's very creepy because it seemed like the man wanted everyone to see his face and take note of him, and that is why he sat in the way that he did. The man also stood out because of his German accent, and he was also dressed in a way that would make him stand out in a crowd, wearing a pink plaid jacket and a fedora all around town. Every time that he was at the Plaza restaurant, he ate the same meal. He would have ham, scrambled eggs, toast, and black coffee. The case would essentially go cold, as nobody came forward, though, with information on a man who had disappeared from his everyday life. No information from family, friends, neighbors. Nobody seemed to know who this mystery man was at all. Ten years after the fact, CTV News would actually have their show W5 look into the case to try and find new evidence and to try and get more eyes on the case so that it would not be forgotten. Around that time, the case would also get what would amount as the last piece of evidence in this case. When workers were preparing a building for demolition, they came across a charred and deformed piece of metal but it was obvious that it had been a gun, and it would be determined that it was in fact the handgun that the bomber had when he was robbing the bank. It had laid atop a building that was blocks away for 10 years before it was discovered. After 30 years, in 2002, the Kenora police chief announced that he had found a piece of the bomber's hair in evidence, and he said that they were going to attempt DNA testing to see if they could find a match. He also would say that there was a man in particular who they were going to test the DNA against, as they had received reports that a man from British Columbia fit the description of the bomber and that the man had disappeared around the time that all of this went down in Kenora. The chief had convinced the man's brother to submit DNA to test against the hair of the bomber. Unfortunately, what appeared to be a break in the case, again, was ultimately not. The DNA was not a match, and in the end, the missing man would wind up being found in France, alive and well. Sadly, there was still no answer to the question of who the Kenora bomber was. Fast forward to today. People often think about this case and why there has not been modern DNA testing done because of the advancement of sites like 23andMe and Ancestry having people doing routine DNA work. The answer is not ideal. In 2009, the Kenora Police Department was shut down and the Ontario Provincial Police took over the jurisdiction and nobody knows where the physical evidence from this case ended up. The OPP reached out, in fact, to the W5 when asked, and they said that they do not have any physical evidence in this case, and that everything that they have has been catalogued in an online database. CTV's W5 actually just recently did another episode on this case, and it was very eye-opening as to how bureaucracy works in situations like this one. I certainly recommend checking out their episode online if you can. 
I was able to use it for fact-checking in this episode, and I'm always blown away at the work that they do on that program to get ears and eyes onto cases that most people have forgotten about or that have just gone so cold that there's no more attention to be had. W5 came across the witness in their investigation, and her name was Barb Manson. She was a witness at the bombing, and she is now a city councillor. But before that, she made a stop working at a cemetery on the outskirts of Kenora. Barb said that she gave tours at night of the history of the cemetery, and that as a part of the tour, she brought up the fact that the remains of the bomber continue to be buried at the cemetery in an unmarked grave. A few weeks after, a woman did a tour with Barb, she reached out, and she actually said that she knew who the bomber was. Barb passed that information along to police, but in the end, the police told Barb that the information that the woman had provided was, unfortunately, another dead end. Just another in a long, long line of them. As I said, though, W5 does yeoman's work, and this case was no different. Knowing that there have been cases in Canada and the United States where the cases have been solved through DNA after disinterring a body, they started to look into what the process would look like in a case like this to do just that. They knew that there were remains, albeit 50 years old, and they knew believably where those remains were. W5 found out that there were three ways to get remains disinterred in a case such as this one. The first is to get a court order. The second was to go through the Attorney General. And the third was to get an order from the Chief Coroner of Ontario. The team at W5 figured that the Chief Coroner was their best and cheapest financially and time-wise option for them to pursue, and so they sent the information to Dirk Heyer, the chief coroner of Ontario. After looking into the case on his own, five months after they reached out to him, Dirk would reach out and agree to be interviewed for the aforementioned episode of the show. Dirk said that in his own investigation, he had come across the fact that the case had actually been recently reopened, and that was deemed to be because of the 50th anniversary of the robbery and bombing. The OPP had reopened the case and even assigned detectives to the case with fresh eyes and a fresh drive to finally discover who the bomber was. Dirk said that while he was himself leaning towards agreement to the disinterment, he would not do so because the case was open and active, and he and his officers like to operate within the guidelines that they will not interfere in open cases and possibly cause any problems with investigations within the case. They will not step on toes or disinter until the case is no longer open. Dirk told W5 that the OPP are legally able to disinter a body as a part of an ongoing investigation. So, W5 reached out to the OPP, and their official stance was this, quote, The OPP, using a victim-centered approach, must place emphasis in allocating costly investigative resources on cases in which a DNA match can bring a measure of comfort and resolution to a victim's family and friends, unquote. So, that is where that sits, because there is nobody that has come forward with names of who the bomber could be, and nobody seems to be looking into the man at the center of the case. The OPP will not put their time, money, and efforts into disinterment. The OPP has actually now said that they do have a DNA sample of the bomber and that that sample is being stored presently in Toronto, meaning that the DNA testing could be done without exhuming the body. However, as of press time, it is not clear if the OPP does plan to do a test on that sample either. So, one would have to believe that disinterment is the answer, 
One day, the officer office of the chief coroner would order that done if need be, but hopefully that won't be needed, and hopefully the OPP do move to test the DNA sample that they have and possibly even exhume the body if they need to. It seems that now, 50 years later, we may actually be closer to finding out who the man was that robbed the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce on May 10th of 1973. There are still so many questions, of course, even aside from who the bomber was. Why did he decide that he was going to or needed to rob a bank? Why did he choose Kenora? Did he intend to die by police officer, or did he find his end only because the police force, without a leader, did what they deemed was the right thing to do? Will we ever know any or all of the answers to those questions? Who knows? Only time will tell, I suppose, but for now it's one heck of a mystery, isn't it? If you know of a family member who fits the description of the rendering on the poster for this episode that went missing around May of 1973, reach out and make a call. Maybe you've been working on a family tree and you've come across a name and a man who look like they disappeared. If they fit any part of the description, make a phone call. The case is open, so I don't think that that would hurt in the least. Hopefully we reconvene one day soon about this case and are able to update you on a at least who the man at the center of the story was. That's all that I have for you goners on this case and all I have for you this week. So I hope that this episode found you well and I hope that you're doing your part to be better in the world around you. Please come back again next week and thank you for hanging out with me again for this episode. See you next time.